<clears throat> hello, hello. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. Hey, good evening, Roger. Thanks for popping in early. All right. Tonight we've got a nice little project for Valentine's Day coming up. So uh, we're going to talk about that. The files for tonight's class are available in the video description. The files for tonight's class are available in the video description uh, if anyone wants to download them. Uh, the CRV file, the Vetric VCAR file, basically can be opened up in VCAR uh, Desktop Pro or Aspire. Uh, version 10 is what I created in. If you don't have version 10, the DXF files for tonight's class, uh, the download link is also in the description file. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, popping in. I appreciate you all. How are y'all doing this evening? Good evening. Good evening. Um, tonight's class is, uh, you know, with Valentine's Day right around the corner, I figured I would do a Valentine's themed project, if you will. Um but mostly, you know, more so than the project itself, uh, tonight's class is going to be um, talking about text on text or also referred to as stacked text uh, designing. Uh, we're going to be working with offsets, uh, DXF files and importing vectors and things. Uh, we're going to talk about um, layers, working with layers uh, with your project and also there's a few things that we're going to go over offsetting and everything so we're there's a few things that uh we're going to go over uh to create this project and everything so uh hopefully y'all enjoy it uh it's uh just a basic valentine's uh, day project and with that being said let's go ahead and get over and kind of take a look at it uh let's see here <laughs> In just a second, we'll get over and take a look at it as soon as it's pulled up. I don't know why I closed it, but uh, oh, I remember why. I was changing my computer screen settings for you guys, uh, so the uh, buttons and everything are nice and and big and all. But um, it's good to see some familiar faces and some new faces. Uh, welcome. I appreciate you all, uh, and um, we'll go ahead and get on over to the project let's get it set up here all right <clears throat> so right now what you'll see is uh the project basically kind of rendering now the quality of the rendering uh, is not going to be that great uh, when I, for some reason, when I change my computer screen settings, uh, everything looks a little rough and pixelated. So hopefully we'll, uh, that'll get cleaned up, you know, in a higher resolution, it looks much cleaner and everything. But, uh, you know, so when you're working on your computer screen, Hopefully you'll get a nice, uh, pleasant view. So basically what we're going to do is I'm just showing you the finished project, uh, give people a chance to take a look at it and uh, kind of get an idea of what it's going to look like. And again, the files, DXF files for this project are in the video description available for download. And so is the CRV file for VCarve Desktop Pro and Aspire and these files uh the v carve or the crv file if you will that is uh it was the project was created in version 10 so if you don't have version 10 you won't be able to open the crv file but you'll absolutely be able to import the dxf files into a project and work along uh to uh you know for the uh, finished results so basically what we've got here is we've got two designs that are going to be carved on two different levels. Uh, this project is using a quarter inch end mill. 
or an eighth inch end mill. Eighth inch end mill, I think, is what I uh, have for the pocket cuts and everything to get nice and tight around the letters and all. Uh, 60 degree V bit, a eighth inch roundover bit, the white side 2050 roundover bit. Uh, I've got set up for this uh, if you want rounded over edges and all. And um, let's see, I believe that's it. Just the roundover bit, the a quarter inch end mill to cut it out and then a quarter or eighth inch end mill for the pocket cut and a 60 degree V bit. So uh, all in all, and this project, let's go ahead. And now that you've seen uh, what it looks like, let's go ahead and get into the job setup and everything and take a look at that. So uh, this project, I designed it so that it could be cut out of um, or cut on our particular machines, the 2440 or the mini carver 1824 for any digital wood carver customers joining me tonight. But the project itself is uh, a single sided job. Now I'm going to change that tonight. I'm going to change it to a two sided job because I'd like to put a keyhole tool path on the back for hanging this on a wall. Um, so I'm going to change it from a single side to a double side project here in just a second. But we're looking at a 19 inch wide a uh, piece of material that is 18 inches along the Y axis. So 19 inches long by 18 inches wide. Uh, when I made this project, uh, you know, of course you can't go to the store and buy a 19 inch board. Uh, basically um, I glued up two, three quarter inch boards and cut it down to size and everything. I wanted a nice big uh, heart uh, for Valentine's day. I didn't want to give, you know, a significant someone, which I didn't, you know, make this for a significant someone, but uh, I don't, I didn't want it to be a small little dinky thing. I wanted something nice that, you know, if it was decorated nicely or whatever, if it came out nice for you and all, it could be hung on a wall as a remembering. It doesn't have to be, a, you know, just something that goes into a, a drawer and gets forgotten about. So 19 by 18 by three quarter inches thick material. Now, for me, my setup, uh, because of my spoil board uh, and everything on my CNC table, I do work from the machine bed, meaning my spoil board is my zero position, but you can work from the material surface. There's no problem with that. Uh, and um, I'm starting from the bottom left corner of the material because my project or my, my table has a 90 degree fence on it that my board's reference against, but you can start from the center uh, from any of the corners. I do recommend starting from the corner on this particular project, any of the corners, uh, for the simple fact that the whole center is going to get milled away and gosh forbid mother nature kicks in and power goes out or something. You got to re find your X, Y, and Z zero. It's going to be a little bit more difficult to find it in the center with it being carved away than it would from one of the corners. Uh, and, um, with that being said, uh, that is our setup. Now, what I'd like to do is I would like to uh, come into the job setup here and I would like to change it to a two sided project. Uh, and I'm going to be still touching off on the machine bed for both sides, but I'm going to flip along my Y axis. OK, so. The. Um, uh, for me, when I'm standing at my table, I stand on the side, I'm going to be flipping it along the Y axis. Uh, you can flip it along the X. That's the first icon here in the flip direction or the Y. I'm going to use the Y. And um, all right. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and click OK and make that change for the two sided project. And it's going to ask me to recalculate the tool pass. I'm not going to do that right now because we're going to be recreating this. I want you to see um, the um, different uh, vectors and everything, but we are going to be starting from scratch. We're going to be starting from two vectors and we're going to start from scratch to create this. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and I've got the layers all created. And one of the things uh, when it comes to working with a two sided project, we want to create our layers right off the bat. So let's get back to the project itself. And um, let's get back to the project itself and let's talk about the layers. So as a default, um, as a default, Vetric creates a layer one. That's your default layer. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that layer one and we're going to rename it. We're going to call it the original. 
because we're going to create the entire design on the original layer. From there, we're going to create two more layers and we're going to call it top layer and bottom layer or top and bottom, however you want to name it, just so you know that one is going to be for the top objects, one is going to be for the bottom objects that are getting carved and things. So you're going to have three layers in this project, original, top layer, and bottom layer. Okay. Now you'll see I have a dimensions layer because you're going to see some dimensions in just a moment when I uh, do our offset and everything. And then I also have a layer called vectors for design. And if you download the files, you're going to have these same layers in your project. And what that is, is, is the two vectors uh, for the design that we're going to be starting off with. So now that we see that, what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that none of these layers exist up here and we're going to create some new layers. So I'm going to call this my class original. My class top layer. And my class bottom layer. Okay, my three layers. Now, I'm going to take these layers that are uh, in that uh, project and I'm actually going to right click and move them to my class original layer. I'm going to move them over there so that way I can uh, turn this off and work in my original layer. Now, what you want to do, whether you access your layers from over here in uh, the left menu, whether you access your layers from here or from the drop down at the top, you want to make sure that your layer that you're working in is bold, is highlighted, is active, if you will, uh, when you're working in it to make sure that the vectors land in the correct spot. So by having this highlighted in bold on the class original, I should be able to read it up here. That is my active layer. And that's what I'm working in right now. And so let's take a look at these two layers. I'm going to hit F9 and get them on the screen on my board here. And let's take a look at what we've got. So basically, I've got a heart vector. Now, if we examine this heart vector closely, if we zoom in, we're going to notice that there's some little issues down here. I don't have a nice point. Uh, my line and everything is a little bit jagged right here you know, and it kind of flattens out at the bottom. You know, it's not real clean looking. If we come up here to the top, my line up here is a little wonky. And that is a technical term, wonky. Uh, and then down here, I have another flat. So I didn't clean these vectors up. And uh, when I provided them to you, because I want you to get used to or learn how to clean vectors up for yourself. Uh, and so that's where we're going to start. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with this heart vector and notice when I click on it, that both of these vector lines get selected. That means they're grouped together, that two of those vectors are grouped together. So it acts like one, when I click on it, when I move it, when I do whatever it acts as one. And I need to first ungroup that. So I'm going to go back to my drawing tab over here. And ungroup is in the edit objects menu, first row, and it's going to be the fifth icon. You have ungroup, and then right next to it, you have group. So I'm going to ungroup these two vectors. You should see them change to a dotted line. And there we go. We can break them up. Now we can work with them. What I'd like to do is I'd like to start focusing on this outside vector first, uh, and just I'm going to work my way up to the top of the heart. So first things first, let's get into node editing. Second icon on the top row. And the line between two nodes is referred to as a span. So the first thing I need to do is I'm going to right click and I'm going to delete that span. It's going to remove that line. Now I want to join these in a nice point uh, at their normal uh, intersection where they would intersect. If those lines were to continue on where they would intersect. And one tool that allows me to do that is my extend tool. It's the second icon on the third row of edit objects. That extend tool will allow me to extend two contours, contours, two lines there, or what have you, to a basic common point of intersection. And if I hover my mouse over this line, you'll see a pink dotted line shoot straight down. And I do the same thing over here. You'll see that shoot down. And so they're going to 
commonly intersect here. So all I need to do is click on this line here and then come over and click on this line here. And it's going to create that joined vector. Okay. All right. Now up here, I've got a little bit of wonkiness going on. So I'm going to close my extend tool and I'm going to go back into node editing. And if I click on this vector here, we'll see we've got some extra vectors here. And between these two vectors, that green vector is my start point. Your green vector or your green node. I'll keep saying vector. Your green node is a start point. But if you notice that that curve there, uh, I've got these two anchor points. They're basically, it's a Bezier curve. And I could very well change that from a Bezier curve to a line by right clicking. You know, I could very well do that. I don't want to uh, do that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, control Z to undo that. What I want to do is I'm going to zoom out and you'll notice we have that nice natural curve kind of being created by the nodes here. And as I zoom in, I'm going to find a common node here. And on this node, I've got this Bezier curve that kind of slightly curves around. And then from this point on, almost straight across from the node over here, I'm going to get rid of everything here. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to delete the span there. I'm going to come in and go ahead and delete that span there as well. Getting rid of this. Uh, delete span. And then even the flat at the bottom, I'm going to right click and delete that span also. And just like before, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my extend tool and I'm going to click here, click here and recreate that to clean that up. Okay. Just click on the two vectors and it will join up for us. All right. So that's going to take care of the lower part of the heart. Now let's get up here and clean this up. Uh, here, all I need to do is um, on the vector here, I need to close my extend tool and go back into node editing. I simply just need to come in here and go into node editing, delete the span, and then I need to extend those two lines by clicking there and there. Now I do not want this sharp point here because when I go to cut out this profile or this design, let's say that I'm using a quarter inch end mill. Let's get a 0.2 in there and everything. My quarter inch end mill is not going to be able to fit down into that corner, you know, to give me that point when I'm cutting and all. And neither is my round over bit or anything like that. So what I need to do uh, for this is I need to put a fillet, a fillet at this sharp point. And I'm going to go into my fillet tool. That's the first icon, third row of the edit objects menu. And because I'm using a quarter inch end mill, my radius, my radius is going to be an eighth of an inch. So I'm going to go ahead and put my mouse over that point. You'll see that check mark pop up. And I'm going to click there and that's going to give me a radius. Okay. Now we're going to go in here and let's go ahead and close the fillet tool and let's go in and clean up this top vector. Notice that line's a little wonky. We're going to go into uh, node editing. And first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, take and delete this span and delete this span. And I'm also, where it's crooked here, I'm going to delete that span there as well. And from here, I'm going to go into my extend tool, extend this out. And then I'm immediately going to go into my fillet tool and put a fillet there. Now at the bottom here, at the bottom here, uh, I'm going to leave it uh, as a sharp point. I could very well fill it this also, just like that. No problem. And uh, I'll go ahead and do that. We'll fill it that as well uh, in case we have a flat area in here and my, you know, I want my bit to uh, be able to get in there, but it's not going to be able to fit in there uh, because of the fact that, you know, my V bit will, but my end mill is too big. Uh, my quarter inch end mill is too big. Uh, but that's okay. We can go ahead and 
radius that like that. So just use the fillet tool on the top and bottom. All right, let's get this vector over here out of the way. Well, if I uh, click on it, we'll get it out of the way and move it over here for a minute. And let's get our heart uh, sized up into shape. Now I'm going to hit F9 on my keyboard to get that centered in my board. And when I double click on an object, it puts that object in the node, not node, sorry. It puts it into um, my <clears throat> transform mode. And that allows me to use my transform tools or be able to transform the object without opening the tools. My little squares around here allow me to size my corners, you know, will size. Uh, your side boxes, white boxes are stretch. You know, and the top box is stretch. Well, I don't want to stretch this. I want to keep the aspect ratio. So I'm going to use a corner box when I size. Uh, but more so, um, I want to make sure I'm centered. But more so when I size this, I want to hold down my shift key, my shift key when I grab one of these corner boxes. And that's going to keep it centered. It's going to keep it centered. OK, so I can size it up and, and center it that way. All right. And I'm going to back off right about here because I do want to put another vector out here for a profile cut towards the end and everything. All right. So let's take a look and see what that gave us. Uh, if I go into my size tool, we basically we're going to have a heart that's 17.72 uh, by 16.32. I'm going to go ahead and make this round this right up to 17 and three quarters. I'm going to leave the height alone because the aspect ratio is linked. X and Y is linked. So I'm just going to get that up to a nice 17 and three quarters because when I offset and create another offset a quarter inch away from my profile, uh, that should bring it out to my uh, 18 inches that I want for this 19 inch board. That'll give me some room where I'm not over extending my project material. All right. So now we have our heart in place and now I've got this little decorative flourish. Now this is where you can be creative. You can do whatever you want. I wanted to do something a little bit different. And when I saw this uh, decorative flourish, it kind of had that heart shape, you know, that half heart shape there. And I really liked it. So that's why I decided to use it for this project. Uh, you know, there may be other flourishes out there that uh, that appeal to you better or you may not want to flourish at all. You might just want to put some text and a nice little saying in here. That's all up to you. It's very um, uh, easy for you to um, use your own imagination and, and, and do what you will. So let's take this uh, flourish here and I'm going to bring it over into this heart area and <clears throat> leaving it as it is right now. It doesn't quite, uh, you know, get where I want to get to and it doesn't fit really where I want to fit to and everything. What I want to do is I'm going to size it up a bit. So I am going to not hold my shift key this time because I just want to pull it down some here. And then I'm going to move it up and looking at this, that curve and all, I'm going to take and rotate it ever so slightly. Just a nice little rotation ever so slightly. And let's pull this down a bit here. And then I'm going to use my arrow keys on my keyboard and just bump that down a bump. So I end up with something like this. Okay. Now I'm going to take and go into and select this object here and I'm going to go into my mirror tool. That's the fourth icon of transform objects. And in my mirror tool, I'm going to create a mirror copy, flip about job center, and I'm going to flip it horizontally. I want a horizontal match right over here. Now looking at that, uh, I am fairly happy with the design. If I wanted to, I could skew things a bit. Let me undo that and let me come back to my original here and let's see if I can pull that up just a little bit. Give it a slight amount more rotation. 
use my arrow keys on my keyboard, bump it down a little bit, and good. So now I'm going to flip that back horizontally. Okay. If you make changes and all, when you're mirroring and stuff, get rid of the one you mirrored, make your change, mirror it again. That way you're not sitting there trying to match them both up or, or what have you. All right. So now I'm getting, you know, uh, the design pretty much uh, starting to lay out the way I want. Uh, but I'd like to kind of connect these two together down here. And what better way uh, to connect them than with a heart? I want to kind of have a little heart shape uh, joining in here and connect them. So I'm actually going to take the outside vector here. And I'm going to double click on it and put it in transform mode. And I'm going to grab this top corner here and I'm going to hold down my shift key, but I'm also going to hold my control key down. My control key will allow me to make a copy while I'm dragging. So if I have my shift and control key down, it's going to keep that heart centered, but it's making a copy of it. And I'm going to size that right down to right about there. Let go of my shift and control after I left click and I'm going to move this down. And I'm going to go ahead and let's focus in on this a bit. I'm going to hold down my shift key this time, keeping it centered. I'm going to size it down to where I have a small amount of overlap in these two areas here. And that's going to be fine there. Now, once again, I'm, I want a double heart here. So I'm going to hold down my control and shift key, grab the corner, and I'm going to drag in the double heart or the, the copy basically. And that looks good there. So that's going to be uh, where I land or where I end up. Now, on these vectors here, here, and here, where that overlap is, I want to join them together. So I'm going to go over to my trim tool, my interactive trim tool, pair of scissors, uh, fifth icon on the second row of edit objects. And I'm going to go ahead and trim these overlaps away, connecting those together. <clears throat> okay. Okay. All right. So now I'm ready to, this is going to kind of be my <clears throat> main back area and everything. And so now I'm ready to uh, start putting in my text or whatever saying or whatever, you know, quote I'm going to do. And in this case, I'm just going to do the word love. Uh, it's Valentine's Day, so we'll use the word love. And then, you know, a first and last name. Um, on the text tool over here, we'll open that up. And <clears throat> I'm going to type in love in capital letters. And for the font, I'm going to use Cooper Black for the font. Uh, it's a nice, fun, rounded letter. Uh, you know, I chose it because it, it, it wasn't square and too blocky. You know, it was kind of uh, uh, fluffy, if you will. Uh, you know, it, it nice curves and everything. Uh, I want to use that for the back uh, font. Uh, no matter what I do with the back font, I want to make sure that I use a bold type uh, letter um, for the simple fact that I'm going to be offsetting all of these vectors inward by a certain amount, which we'll talk about in a moment. And I want to make sure that no part of my vectors disappear uh, and everything. So nice and bold. Now, looking at this word here right off the bat, uh, I can see that I don't like how close the V and the E are together. So I'm going to go into my space, edit spacing and curve tool for text. And I'm going to put my mouse between the V and the E, and I'm going to hold down my shift key while I left click to push those apart. Okay. So however much I want to push them apart and just one click looks good to me. So get out of that, go back into normal selection mode, my normal selection arrow to get out of that text tool and everything. All right. Hopefully you're all still with me and I haven't put you to sleep yet. 
Okay, so with the word love here, I'm going to go ahead and get that centered up. Just hit F9 on my keyboard, and I'm going to move it up. I want it up here, and I'm going to go ahead and size it up. Now, I'm not only going to stretch it holding my shift key. I'm not only going to stretch it uh, this way until I get a bit of an overlap uh, on one side and the other, but I'm also going to stretch it up some, and I'm going to move it down. I don't want I don't want it to intersect with these two parts up here, but I do want it to be a bit taller. So I'm going to stretch it up. That's that middle, your middle uh, points when you're in transform mode. So we're going to stretch that up. So that way it's nice and big in the background and everything. You know, I want that word to really stand out and all. Now, as I was stretching it up, I moved down. So now I have more of an overlap over here, probably not as much as I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use my arrow keys on my keyboard and I'm going to bump up. Now, if you want to bump up in full movements, you just use your arrow keys, whatever they are. But if you hold down your control key, you can bump in micro movements. When you hold your control key with your arrow keys, you can get micro movements and stuff and all. So we're good there. Uh, I am going to grab the side over here, hold down my shift key and stretch it in a little bit. Kind of almost like condense it together, squish it together a bit. And I just want a little bit of overlap on the two sides. Okay. All right. So that's going to be our back text, if you will. That's going to be the back text. And everything. All right. Now, if I went ahead and as a design, if I went ahead and V-carve this, uh, some of you may or may not know that a V-carve toolpath, when looking at a design, it cuts between the lines, meaning that it will, if I were to V-carve this whole design, it would cut between these two lines, skip in this area here, carve within these lines, skip within this area, so on and so forth. Now, these are going to be trimmed together here in just a minute. I haven't gotten that far yet, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to carve in here and skip this area and carve in here. I want all of this area in here to be carved away so that the my flourishes and my text and all are raised up. So that's going to require me to create an additional line or vector out here. So I need to offset this outward. And before I go into another step, let's get over here and clean up our word love. We're going to, first of all, this is text. If I go into my automatic trim tool here, I can't, I, if I see them scissors stay closed, you know, I can't trim that because it's a text. It's a font. It's not a vector, the word love. I have to convert that to a curved object. You know, I got to convert it to a vector. And that's that T with all the little nodes around the points. And all. when I click there, now my word love is no longer a font. It is a vector. And so now I can come in and interactively trim. Trim those two lines the way there. And I'm going to trim those way over there. And essentially, by doing that, when I click on this vector, all of this is now joined together as one closed vector, you know, because they're all tied together and everything. All right. So from there, let's go back to our outside border. Remember I said I wanted to offset this. Now this additional offset line and everything is going to end up being my, uh, uh, a, not my profile cut line, but the line that my V bit is going to cut between to create a nice decorative groove around here there will be an additional offset once again uh, for the final profile cut, but let's do one at a time. Let's get this vector offset and I'm going to offset outward and I'm going to go a distance of a quarter of an inch. I'm going to create, uh, there is no sharp corners, so I can turn that off. I don't need to create sharp corners and just make sure I se hit select new. And that's going to give me this offset here. Now up here, it looks like there's a bit of a point, but it's not. If we zoom in, it's radius as well and everything. So now when I V-carve, my V-carve is going to cut between these letters or these lines 
skip, cut between these lines, skip, cut between these, so on and so forth, all the way through until it, you know, and since this is all joined together, all of around this is going to be carved away. And then just my text is going to be raised up and all that wonderful stuff. So <clears throat> now that we had that now, when I carve, when I do the V carve and everything, and it cuts that groove around here, I'm going to have a nice little V groove, like a nice little channel and everything. And if we go over back over to the 3d view, which disappeared and I don't want to have to preview it again, but if we go, uh, if we, if that wouldn't have disappeared like that, I hate that. But, um, if we go back into the 3d view, let's see here if it'll let me, if it'll pop it back into place. No dog on it. Um, but let's, uh, let's see if we can at least get the top view done preview visible toolpath. This groove that you see right here, this outside groove being formed, uh, that's that's gonna that's the result of that additional vector that we just created. That additional offset uh, creates that outer groove, skips, creating that nice little rim, and then it's gonna go in and carve all of this area away that you see happening in the preview here. We're gonna stop that. We don't need to preview it and all, but if we look at the solid view here and everything ignore the word john we haven't put that in there yet but you can see that tool is going to carve it's going to skip carve now of course that's not the right size vectors and all this is a preview of an older tool path but um it's going to carve away here let's do this so i don't confuse you let's do this the smart way i'm going to create a v carve tool path on this entire design I'm going to have a start depth of zero, a flat depth of an eighth of an inch, 60 degree V bit, and I am using an eighth inch end mill for a flat area clearance tool. If I calculate this tool path, and we're gonna we're gonna be focusing on the tool path here in a minute. I'm just wanna focus this for the preview purposes, but you can see here that by creating that additional offset. It's going to be carving between these lines, the blue areas where it's carving, skipping, creating that nice little rim. And then it's going to be carving all of that area away, leaving my flourishes and, and design and everything raised. Okay. So that's why we had to create that additional offset. Had I not created that offset, had I not created that offset, Turn that off and let's go in here and calculate that tool path. Uh, let's stop that calculation. Turn that off and don't you mess with me today. There you go. <clears throat> Had I not created that offset, then it would have carved between these lines, left all of this area uncut and then carved my letters away. And as far as a, just a regular little V carved sign and everything, not bad, you know, with a flat depth and stuff. It's not a bad looking little sign if you do it that way, but that's not what I want for the text on text for that raised text effect and everything. So we want that additional offset. I'm trying to go into as much detail. Sorry guys, if I'm harping, but I'm trying to just go into a mu as much detail as I uh, can to, um, explain why we're doing the things that we do. All right. So we've got our back text here. Got it laid out. Um, I'd like to, uh, before I do the top text, I'm going to grab my ellipse tool and right here in this open space, I'd like to create an ellipse. And let's move this down right about here and let me size that a little bit there get that make sure that's centered left and right which it is and I'm gonna throw in a nice little established uh, you know in a date or a date or something you know so I'm gonna go into the text here and I'm gonna use a monotype Corsiva uh, font for that. And I'm just going to go EST. 
2020. And uh, we'll make that text uh, about, um, uh, let's go a half inch tall. Bold. Give your monotype course of us some boldness, some text and everything. Let's get that centered in there. And then I'm going to uh, kind of stretch it to fit. So I'm going to hold down my shift key and pull that up a bit. Hold down my shift key. Pull that up a bit. And while it's there, I'm going to hold down my shift key and select on this vector. And then I'm going to go to my alignment tool and I'm going to make sure that it's centered inside of that last selected vector, which it is. And everything, you know, and let's uh, pull that away a bit. There we go. OK, so I'm going to have that little established uh, placard, if you will, in there. Now, if we take a look at um, my original vectors that you guys got, uh, the DXF vectors and everything, if I turn off the class layer for a moment and I turn on the original vectors, uh, you'll notice that <clears throat> in the original design, which you have, uh, there's a little bit more room uh, between the top of the heart and that inside oval. That's the oval I just created in the layer that we were working in. And from that inside, there's a little bit of room before the love. So that way I can create an offset and that offset is going to be important. So when looking at, if I turn that off and go back into our class layer here, when I go to offset this, um, it's, I'm going to, be running into things unless I make this smaller and it all depends on what size you want it to be and everything, but you do have the original uh, vectors and everything and you can see. And the reason why they're not exactly the same is because on my flourishes, I made them a little bit bigger uh, in this class. Uh, I made them a little bit bigger. I went a little overzealous and everything, uh, but my heart was sitting a little high. I need to bring, I needed to size my heart down and bring it down into this area. some. So I'm going to backtrack and this is what I love about the undo button for a moment. I'm going to backtrack and when I backtrack, it's going to get rid of that offset or that text and that oval. It's going to get rid of that offset. It's going to get rid of my trim. I'm just hitting and holding my control key down. I'm backtracking and everything with my text. Oops, not that far. Control Y. Okay, I want to get here. I want to get this tight and right. So what I'm going to do is on my heart, I'm going to, oops, on my heart, I'm going to size that down. Just a little bit more. And I'm going to bump it down until I get an overlap right about there. Bringing that down. Uh, one more little bump. And then I'm going to go ahead and trim, trim, bringing that heart lower, you know, kind of filling in that space a bit. I'm going to go ahead and go back into my text tool. We've all seen this just a moment ago. Uh, capital L-O-V-E. I'm going to go to my Cooper Black, Cooper Black font. Make sure it's bold and We'll get that sized up to about one and a half inches tall so I can see it. Get this up into position and hold down my shift key. Stretch her out. Stretch it out. Bump it down some. One, two. Everything I just did, I'm just redoing it. Come in a little bit. And... Now I've got plenty of room in here for my, um, take my font, turn it into a vector and trim, blending those, oops, not the L, blending that together. So now we're back where we were, almost back where we were. I'm going to take my heart, offset it outward a quarter of an inch. 
And then I'm going to create my ellipse. And now we're back where we were. Let's get my established in here. EST oh, 2020. And I want that to be a monotype course of a bold. And it's gonna, it should be about three quarter inches tall. Three quarter inches tall is what I like. And now I'm going to stretch my ellipse out. to fit and now I've got plenty of room above and below here because when I offset this vector outward that ellipse outward I'm going to go outward uh, a eighth of an inch I want to make sure that I'm not close to my letters here or the top of my heart here which I'm not so sometimes you got to go back to move forward and in this case, I did. I had to just make some slight adjustments. You know, you don't really know. Um, oops, I got to space my E. So what I'm going to do is rather than uh, recreate the wheel here and everything, I'm going to go into node editing. And... Uh, let's just undo it. Control Z. One more time. All right. Someone caught me and said, hey, space your E. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. So I'm going to go ahead and bump that E over. Space it out. And then I got to get this recentered. And... That looks good. All right. Thanks for the catch there, uh, Terry Parrish. Appreciate that. All right. Let's get back in here. Trim. 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 Offset the heart outward. Quarter of an inch. Create my ellipse. Now, if you have your smart snapping on up here, if you are in version 10 or 9.5 and 10 smart snapping and geometry snapping, you'll get these nice, pretty little uh, dotted lines that pop up, kind of get you, it'll let you snap your vectors to uh, center and everything, which is nice. And let's get that down here. Get my text in there. E-S-T period. 2020 let's get past this 2020 bold close that move that up here and there we go so we'll take this and offset it outward an eighth of an inch and we're caught back up okay so that takes care of all the vectors except for the top text, uh, our names or whatever, you know, whatever we're going to put here. And in, and in my case, um, uh, in my case, uh, I'm just going to just make up two random names. Um, you know, I don't have a uh, significant other to give a Valentine's to, so we're just going to wing it. And so... We're going to go ahead and um, I'm just going to go John and Jane Doe. John and Jane. All right. Now, for John and Jane, the font that I, I went through different fonts and everything, and I want this, let's get this up to about an inch and a half. The different fonts and all I looked at, and I, I, I you know, ended up settling on this Blenda script font here. Um, I ended up settling on this Blenda script font and Blenda script can be found at dafont.com. Dafont.com. And if we were to open up a web browser 
and jump into www.dafont.com, defont.com. I recommend defont.com because it's a place where you can find thousands of fonts uh, for both personal and commercial use uh, for download. Uh, a lot of different nice decorative fonts and everything. And um, in this case, I'm going to go with the B L E N D A, Linda. And I'm going to hit search. And that's going to take me to the Blenda script font here and download it. And notice it's 100% free, meaning it's 100% free for both personal and commercial use. Uh, and it's a really nice script looking font uh, that, that I find attractive. Uh, but that's where you would download it from. So Blenda on defont.com. Uh, and then you can download that file. Now, might as well teach you guys and girls uh, who are new to this uh, how to download a file. Or, or, or install a font into your computer. Uh, so we're going to hit download on this. And wherever it downloads, whether it down, like I'm in Google Chrome, so it's downloading at the bottom left corner here. Or if you're in Firefox, it'll download your little download arrows up here. If you're in Internet Explorer or Microsoft Edge, it's going to ask if you want to save or run. You're going to save it, whatever folder you save it into. That's what you'll open afterwards. Uh, but all I need to do down here in Google is just click down here and it is a zip file. Now, generally, unless you have an older computer that runs WinZip and stuff like that, generally uh, in the newer computers, uh, you have an extraction tool built into your file explorer. So anytime it opens a zip file, it's going to show you the compressed tool folder tools. If it doesn't show the extract all button, just click on compressed folder tools here and it will show the extract all. So I'm going to click on that and it's going to open up my extraction tool and I'm going to go ahead and click extract. And when it extracts, it's going to open a second file explorer window here and it's the unzipped files. And what I'm looking for is not the JPEG file, but the open type or true type font, whatever it might be. Uh, that's all I need. And when you right click on that font, you'll have an option to install, install. And I don't need to install it. I already have it, but that's all you do. Once you've installed your font, all you simply have to do is close your text tool and reopen it and that font will be in your list. Okay, so that's it. That's all there is to installing a font onto your computer and then being able to pull it into your Vetric. Once you just close, if you have your text tool open, close it and reopen it. All right, now we are drawing in our original layer. So everything is stacked on top of each other and everything and, and you know, you, you'll have to get used to that, you know, what you're looking at and things. Uh, you can separate your layers into layers, you know, to make things work with. But we're creating a design, an overall look, if you will, and everything. So we're going to do all the creation in the original layer. And then in just a few moments, once we get everything laid out, then we will separate everything by their appropriate layers. Now, for John and Jane, a uh, couple of things you want to notice. We do have some overlapping lines. That we're going to have to get rid of. But before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and let's get it centered. Use my alignment tool, get it centered left to right. And then I'm going to size it up. Now, where this gets placed, you can, a lot of people you go right in the center, you know, over the word. Sometimes it kind of hides what the word is behind it. I tend to either go at the bottom, you know, where you can see the word or at the top where you can see, you know, it really depends, uh, not all the way at the top, but, you know, just, just so I can make out the letters behind it and get an idea of what it says in the background. Because sometimes, depending on how many characters are in your names or the names and then the, the last name, um, uh, Sometimes it just gets, you know, it kind of gets hidden, you know, uh, and all. And so uh, I'm going to, uh, for me, in the design here, I'm going to kind of ride a little high up here. 
And I am going to stretch the text out a bit. Stretch it out just a little bit. Okay. And I don't mind that it's going over my flourish. Kind of like that a lot. So I'm also going to stretch it out this way some. And the reason why I do that, it gets the J and everything off of the, you know, right over the center of the L, you know, the O I can kind of, I can make out, I'll be able to make out that that's an L and that's an O and this is a V and everything uh, and all. So, you know, I want to stretch it out and everything. Don't mind if I go into my flourish. That's what it's all about. It's text on text. So this layer of text is on top of everything else, you know, and the names are important and stuff and all that wonderful jazz. All right, so I'm going to stretch this out a bit more and pull this up a little bit. All right, let's make sure I'm centered left to right, uh, which I am. And that's going to be my top text. So as far as the design is concerned, it's finished. OK, that we're finished with all of the creation of the design that we need. Now what we need to do is clean up some things and separate them and all. OK, so first off, I'm going to take all of my vectors here, all of my borders. And I'm going to hold down my shift key and select my top text. Here. And I'm also going to um, that's it. Uh, I'm going to right click and I'm going to copy, not move, but copy to the top layer. Leave your original intact so that if you got to go back and pull something from it, you have it. I'm going to go up to my layers tab and turn off that top text layer. It doesn't need to be on right now. Okay. Now I'm going to take my vectors again. Always have your borders on both layers. I'm going to take my borders again along with my V, my O, the inside of the heart, and this. Basically, everything else except for the top object, whatever you're going to have on top, everything else uh, is going to be right-click and copied to the bottom layer. Okay? Once that's done, we can now turn off the original layer. We don't need it visible anymore. I want you to notice something here. Notice when I turn that layer off, how it turned red here. That's telling me that, hey, the current active layer is not visible. Are you sure you want to do that? And of course, no, I don't, because I'm going to be moving into another layer here. Um, we're going to start off with the top text layer uh, and clean it up and everything. Uh, but when you see that red, that's what that means. It means that current active layer is vis invisible. It's turned off, you know, uh, turn it back on or change layers. Okay, so I'm in my top layer here. And the only thing I need to do in my top layer is I need to weld, weld these letters together. Now I say weld because in version 10, we now have the capability of welding text by using the weld tool, which is a one click, click. It'll ask me if I want to keep my original text or replace it with the welded text. I want to replace it. And now all of my text is welded together. But in older versions of the software, if I undo that, older versions of the software, we need to convert the text to a curve first, breaks it up, and then we can use our interactive trimming tool if we wanted to. And we could use our scissors and trim away. Oops, not that part of the H. Trim away. Or, or, we could select the outside vectors that are overlapping, not the inside, just the outside, and we could weld those together to achieve the results. Either way, uh, you can just interactively trim all the overlaps with your scissor interactive trim tool, or you can select just the overlapping vectors and weld them together to achieve the result. Either way, okay? Now, these are all broken up. So what I want to do is I'm going to take and select all of them and I'm going to group, group them back together. Okay. I want them grouped together. 
All right, that is all I had to clean up and all I had to do in the top layer. So let's go ahead and turn off that top layer and let's go into the bottom layer. Now the bottom layer, we've got some stuff that we've got to do here, um, especially if, if we're doing a text on text using the V carve method. So there's two ways of doing text on text or stack text, however you want to call it. Uh, one is using your pocket tool paths, straight cuts, you know, and things. I'm not a big fan of that. I think it looks a little more elegant and everything using the V carve method. But because if we, but if we use the V carve method, then we have to do something with our bottom text or our bottom object, if you will, that we don't have to do if we did a pocket, uh, you know, text on text with a pocket cut, everything's getting cut straight down, you know, you know, to your depths, you know, your top layer, your bottom layer is getting cut straight down. And so no offsetting is required. None of that stuff with a V carve, our V bit, our V bit, if I go and grab a 60 degree, where's my 60? Oop. See what happened there when I drew that? You see that John and Jane pop back up? Because I did not change layers. My active layer still says top layer here, so it popped back up. So I'm going to undo what I just did. I'm going to come back in here and turn off that top layer and make sure that I make my bottom layer active because that's what I'm drawing in. It threw in my, when as soon as I drew that object, it threw my top layer back active and everything because I was essentially drawing in the top layer. Even though I was in the bottom, I was drawing in the top. Uh, so make sure your layer is active. You should be able to see it up here. And that's one of the things I should have looked at. So once again, let's uh, come over here and uh, draw my 60 degree V bit for this discussion. Okay. When I'm carving with my V bit there, it, it's not straight down. There's an offset distance from here to here. And that offset distance, depending on how deep that bit's going to be cutting in for the design, I need to know what that offset is. And we have to take whatever that offset is and offset our objects inward to match. And what I mean by that is, let me take a line here. And I always draw out my bit. I draw out my, if I'm using a 60, I draw out a 60 degree V bit here. And right at the tip of the bit, I'm going to draw a line straight out. Doesn't matter how long the line is, just draw a line. Now that line represents my top of my board. This V bit is my V bit sitting on top of my board. I'm going to be taking, and I need to determine how tall I want my top text, how tall I want my bottom text. How deep do I want this project being cut? For me, I want a total cut of a quarter inch deep. Eighth inch top text, eighth inch bottom text for a total cut or a total you know, height of a quarter of an inch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this line using the move tool. I'm going to move it relative to its current position on the Y. Y is up and down. And I'm going to move it an eighth of an inch up. Now, the distance from the tip of that bit to that intersection there, that's the offset that I need to know. That's my magic number. So I'm going to use my dimension tool over here. And I'm going to go horizontally, measure horizontally, from the tip to the intersection. That offset distance is 0.0722. Okay, so that's my offset number. Okay, on my number. Now, now that we have that, let's back out here and let's answer a quick question. <clears throat> Jeff jumps in and says, I still don't understand how adding an outside offset made the V-carve cut in different places. All right. So once again, a V-carve toolpath cuts between two lines. And a V-carve toolpath automatically calculates, if we open up the V-carve toolpath here, a V-carve toolpath looks at the space between two lines and it automatically calculates how deep it needs to cut for those two lines to meet at a V, okay? So I can't use my V-carve toolpath 
with a single line vector, unless I want the whole center of that single line vector being milled away. Generally, I have, you know, two lines. Um, and when I say single line vector, I'm referring to an open vector, not a circle, whatever. But if I have a single line vector here, and I try to calculate my V carve toolpath, it's not going to let me, okay? I need at least two lines because the V carve toolpath cuts between two lines. And it looks at the space between two lines and it automatically calculates how deep it needs to cut. Wider space, deeper cut. Shallower space, shallower cut, you know? Uh, it also depends on your router bit angle as well. Well, in this case, if I did not have this offset here, Jeff, and I carved and I selected my entire design, except for that outside, oops, except for that outside offset. Get in there. My V carve toolpath is going to look at this as the starting point here, and it's going to carve between these two lines here. It's going to skip between these two lines, carve between these two lines, skip between these two, car between these two, on and on and on, all the way around the design. I do not want it to, uh, you know, carve in here and then skip all this. All this area I want milled away. That's what I want gone. So in order to do that, I have to create an additional offset so that now it's carving between these two lines, skipping between these two, carving between these two lines here, and let's turn these off. You know, it's carving between here, skipping between these two, carving here, so it's carving everything, leaving my design raised. That's why we have that offset. Let me know, hopefully that explained it a little bit better. All right, let's get back to my magic number here, 0 0.0722, that's my offset distance and everything. And what I need to do is, when we are cutting, and let me draw a line here, and let's 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 see if I can illustrate this. Imagine this is the top of my board, okay? And imagine I'm doing my quarter inch cut, you know, my letters and all. All right, so this is the top of my board, and my V cut, my my pocket, my pocket is going to be a quarter of an inch down here. There's an offset, and when I want my letters, you know, from all the way from the bottom of that pocket cut to the top of my letters, I want that nice angled transition based on, you know, whatever bit I'm using and all. I don't want any stair steps or anything. I want a nice transition. In order to do that, if I were to leave my bottom object the size that it is, then I would end up with a... Let's see if I can go to note editing and do this. Insert a point. Insert a point. Bear with me. Let me draw this out. Y on the keyboard. I would end up with, from my top text transition to my bottom text, I'd end up with a little stair step. And it wouldn't be a nice transition. So what I need to do is I need to offset my bottom text inward by the amount that my offset number was um, to create that nice transition in everything. And whatever the number is, is going to be based on the angle of your bit and how deep. If I want my pocket to be three eighths of an inch deep, that means my top text is a 3 16th. My bottom text is 3 16th. That offset number is going to be 0 0.0822 or something like that. Uh, or no, I'm sorry. Uh, it'd be a little bit more than that. But um, if I wanted to be a uh, half inch deep, you know, with quarter inch top text letters, quarter inch bottom text letters, if I wanted 3 16 inch top text letters and quarter inch bottom text letters, those different numbers and all, those are going to determine my you know, they're going to change based on the V bit, based on the depth of cut and everything. Uh, they're going to change um, that offset amount and everything. If you're doing a straight pocket tool path, you know, uh, uh, text on text, you don't have to worry about that because that end mill cuts straight down. 
You know, there is no offset to can be concerned with and all, but it doesn't look as good. And so what I have to do is the object that my top text is contacting with. Uh, let's get out of note editing. Even the love. Even the love. Okay. And this heart too. Uh, yeah, I'll do this heart too. Uh, even this heart too. I do not, I'm not, I do not need to offset my established in here. It's not part of, you know, the, the main design that my text is, uh, overlapping. My top text is overlapping. Uh, this is a standalone, uh, part of the design here. So I do not need to offset it inward. Um, the, but up here, I need to offset this inward by the amount of my offset 0.0722. And when it, when it carves, it's going to carve to the full shape of this design before the offset, but it's going to create a nice transition, a nice V angle transition, uh, and everything between the top and bottom text. It sounds confusing, and I know it does, but trust me, offset your back text in when you're doing a V carve text on text toolpath, and it'll be golden. Okay, and you kind of get it. Um, all right, so in my case, I need to select this here, and I'm going to go into the offset selected vectors inward 0.0722. Now, Here's the important part. This is why I chose a big, bold font. If I didn't have any of this flourish, no, if it was just text in here, and uh, let me see, let me draw some text to explain this better. Uh, let's go, we'll go with my name. And I'm just going to go with a New Times Roman. You know, everybody likes Times New Roman, not New Times Roman, but Times New Roman or Tahoma. I'll go Times New Roman. Uh, let's go all capital letters, L-A-N-E-Y. Uh, let's go uh, give it a little bit of boldness and everything. All right. So even in this font here, font choice and boldness is going to be, uh, you know, important in everything because I have to offset this inward, you know, and when I offset, what's going to happen to these skinny areas? Well, let's find out. Let's make this text. Let's give it a decent sized about the size of my love a little bit bigger and I'm going to offset it inward 0.0722 deleting the original do not create sharp corners on your offset leave that unchecked select new and I'm going to offset now in this case here <clears throat> don't worry it looks funky right it looks funky but it will carve looking like that it will carve looking like that when it carves but during this it looks real funky now on this particular font here at that offset 0.0722 because i'm only going an eighth inch deep you know for my letters and all no problem nothing deleted that that is still intact that font is still intact over here this font is still intact there's no parts of any of the letters that are deleted and everything so I can use this font with that offset, no problem, you know, for my back text. But what if I was going 0.15 inches deep for my top text, just one five from one, two, five to one five, you know, that's, that's a little less than, you know, it's about five thirty seconds inch deep, you know, for my top text and bottom text, that's an offset distance of 0.0822. And let's undo this back to our normal. And if I offset this inward, now my font has been deleted. So if I wanted to go 0.15 inches deep for my top text and 0.15 inches deep with my bottom text, I could not use this font because when I offset that font inward, the required distance based on my bit and everything, my font deteriorates. You know, it's gone. There's no, there's no font there. So I can't use that font, you know, so font choice is important. Now, luckily, in this case, we only had to offset 0.0722 because I'm only going an eighth inch deep. And even at that font still intact, it's still good. 
And when it carves, it looks funky, right? You know, it's all skinny and scrawny. Is that what it's going to carve like? No. When it carves, it'll carve looking like that, you know, um, and everything. So in this case, I need to take my flourish, flourish, everything. Oops, not the two borders. My flourish, even though a little hard in here and everything. And this is what I need to offset in because it's part of the design that my top text is going to be making contact with and everything. And, you know, uh, the, the vector down here, the heart, that could be debatable, you know, whether to offset that or not. But because it is part, you know, I want this exact spacing and everything, everything that's kind of part of this design, not the established, but, you know, the design that my top text is going to carve on, all of that is important is relative so it's all going to get offset inward so we're going to take that and we're going to go offset inward 0.0722 delete the original from the bottom layer it's not the actual original but you know delete this vector create a new one don't use sharp corners always leave that turned off we're going to offset that inward and create that shape now it doesn't look like it changed too much if i go undo you can see the difference redo you know so um, it doesn't look like that much difference. Now it will cut out to my full size of my original design and everything because of the way that the V carve and everything works. Okay. All right. So now that this is offset inward, that was the last thing I had to do to get everything ready to carve this design. Okay. So a quick recap. We created an original design, got it all laid out. Once we did that, we took the borders. Now, sometimes, a lot of times when you have, uh, you know, single text on text or whatever, and you got a square sign, you generally have, you know, like your board and you got an internal border and then you got your text in here and all. And you, if you have a single border, that border and your text gets copied to one layer, that same border and your bottom text get copied to the other layer. You know, that's that's how it goes. In this case, I've got three borders here. OK, I've got three borders. So they all need to go on each of the layers, top and bottom. All right. Because they all play a role in this design. So we took our um, original design and we copied the top text in the three borders to the top text layer. We took our bottom text and design and everything that was at the bottom and our three borders and copied it to the bottom layer. Basically everything that's, you know, uh, needs to be there. And um, that has given us our two working layers that we're working with. Okay. On our top text, we welded our text, cleaned it up, grouped it back together, right? On our bottom text, we offset it inward. You know, our bottom object. I keep saying text, you know, but it's the object. The bottom object got offset inward. Now, that's all done. So we're done. The only last thing I need to do is, in my top layer, I need to take my top text and make a copy of it. Copy of it to the bottom text layer. Oh, God, Laney, why are you doing that? Well, I'll tell you. We have to have, you know, there's meat here that, you know, when this top layer gets carved and everything, my letters are going to go from the top of my board all the way down to the quarter inch depth, you know, full depth of cut. And there's got to be some wood underneath there. All right. Uh, and so I've got to weld a copy of this top text with my bottom object so that it creates a boundary that my router bit won't cut this wood away. So my top text has something to some foundation, you know, underneath it and everything. And so we're going to take our object here. Notice I'm not selecting the bottom circle. Don't need to. It's not welding with this. Um, my O and my V, my bottom object, 
I'm going to group it together, the bottom object, group it together as one. Okay. And that way I'm going to be welding this grouped object with my top grouped object. Weld that together. And it's going to create this outline. Okay. Now when my router bit comes in here and starts cutting away, it now will cut around this wood instead of through it. If that top text wasn't there, you know, if that boundary line wasn't there, it cut right through it and I would have no foundation for my top text to sit on. So now I've created a boundary line for my carving for my top text. So when I turn on that top text layer, it has something to sit on. Okay. You with me? That is the most, I don't know why, but is the most confusing part uh, that when I get to this, that people, uh, you know, in all the classes, when I teach text on text and everything, this is the part that confuses them the most. Uh, and I do not know how to explain it to where it's not confusing, but basically it's the foundation. I had to create a boundary, my vector boundary foundation so that my top text has something to sit on when it's carving. You know, I can't just float there in midair. <laughs> Um, so we had to weld a copy of that top text with the bottom object to create that borderline, that boundary line, that foundation and all. Okay. Now, Lainey, why do you only have the established 2020 on the bottom layer and not at the top? Isn't this going to be cut? you know, from the top down uh, or what's going to happen with the established 2020. Well, I want the established 2020 to be uh, down on the bottom layer. I want it to be a different level than the very top of my object and everything. You know, my top text and all, I don't want it starting from the top of the board, you know, and down. Uh, I want to just have this design um, on the bottom layer. So all this, when I do, when I create the tool path for that top text, all of this inside material is getting milled away. All of it, that whole eighth of an inch of material is getting milled away. And then when I start carving that bottom text part of the design, then my establish is going to be in there. And so it's going to be lower than the top level and it's just going to give it some dimension. You know, it's going to give it some, you know, it's not everything, you know, all together. It just gives it some depth, you know, some dimension, if you will. So that's why I have no objects on my uh, top text layer. And uh, that's why it's only on the bottom text layer. Now, if if I wanted this part of the design to carve from the top all the way down to the bottom of the, you know, the quarter inch pocket, then I would have this on my top text layer and all that stuff. But I don't, I don't want that. And if it was, forget, let's say if I didn't have these borders here, let's say if I didn't have these borders here, and I just had my text there and I wanted this text to carve all the way from the top to the bottom. I wanted that night, you know, when I'm doing that top text toolpath, I have to have something protecting this uh, from getting carved away. You know, that wood getting carved away when I, you know, mill that top pocket, you know, in here. I, if I mill that wood away, then there's no wood for my established 2021. So I would have to create some kind of boundary, whether I do a rubber band boundary or, or, or uh, something, you know, around my text just to protect it. So that wood, I got to create some kind of border so my wood doesn't get carved away, you know, so I can then, you know, carve my text and all. Well, in this case, I don't need that. I don't want that because all of this is getting cut lower than the top surface. So I do not need a copy of it 
on the top text layer. Hopefully you guys are with me and you will be with me once we start creating the tool pass because it'll make sense then. All right. Our design is done, fully ready to go, ready to make some tool pass and everything. The only vector that I'm missing is my um, final profile cut, you know, and that I'm going to go ahead and throw it in now. Let's turn off this and this and go back to the original layer because I'm going to draw it on the original layer. It does not need to be on. Um, uh, let's hear. Let's do this. I'm just going to throw it on the uh, a new layer. <clears throat> Profile cut out vector. Profile cut out vector. If I learn how to spell profile, it'll be all right. Profile cut out vector. All right. Whatever you want to name it. The reason why I'm creating it on a different layer, ladies and gentlemen, is because, is because that I'm going to be associating my top and bottom layers with a toolpath and anything that's on that layer gets cut. So I do not want my profile. Why did it do that again? Um, bear with me a second. There we go. Um, I do not want my border getting cut with my top text or my bottom object. I want it to be cut by itself. It's the final profile cut and everything. So I'm going to just put it on its own little vector. And so with that, that, or that layer active, I'm simply going to select this vector and copy it to that layer. And then I'm going to take and offset this out because that's we're going to end up deleting this one. I'm going to offset outward. And now it really comes down to how, you know, I got a 19 inch board here. I could make my heart a little smaller so I could get a nice half inch offset around here, a nice lip, you know, around there for that profile cut. If I offset this uh, 0.5 inches, uh, let's go 0.375 inches, three eighths, three eighths. Uh, delete the original. don't need that one. That brings me right right to the edge oh ever so over the edge by just a hair you know so rather than changing all my vectors or scaling things up i'm simply going to change my board size i've already got a glue a board together anyway so instead of 19 inches wide i'm going to go 19 and a half give myself an extra half inch Nineteen and a half. There we go. Good boy. All right. Oh boy, I, it didn't like me doing that. I typed a little bit too fast. I changed it to nine, then delete, then nineteen and a half, and it didn't like that at all. All right. Notice that when I stretched out nineteen and a half, it put all the wood over on this side. Everything's over here in the center. I need to make sure that everything stays consistent. So I'm turning on all my layers. Okay. All my layers, my class layers, everything that I'm working with here. All of them are on. All of them are visible. I'm going to select every single one of them. And I'm simply going to align them to the center of the material. Shift them all over. Okay. Then I'm going to go back in here and turn off everything that, you know, I'm not working with now. But get make sure you move everything everything together if you have to if you got to adjust your size or anything so now i've got a profile cut vector uh there and uh that's going to be good that's what i want all right so everything's created everything's done it's ready to create the tool pass now and you're going to see a lot of tool pass in here and everything 
I'm going to go ahead and delete them all so this does not confuse you. These are all my original ones. I will recreate them for you. Well, you guys already have the file, so it's already in the description. Delete all. All right. So have no tool pass. Here we go. Are we ready? Are you ready? Okay, let's get everything centered up here. Let's get our, uh, what you want to do is you want to turn on your bottom text layer and your top text layer. Make sure that those layers are turned on, okay, and active and everything, because we are going to associate the layer with the toolpath. What I mean by that is I'm going to create a V-carve toolpath, and we'll focus on the top text layer first. We're going to start at zero and we're going to have a flat depth of an eighth of an inch. That's how tall my letters are, remember? So if your letters were three sixteenths and three sixteenths, then that's your flat depth. Okay. So for me, it's going to be an eighth and an eighth for a total of a quarter. All right. Eighth inch. <clears throat> now I'm going to be using a 60 degree V bit and I'm also going to be using an eighth inch end mill for all the flat work. OK, I could use a quarter inch in mill, but, you know, the quarter is not quite going to get into a lot of these areas and stuff the way that I would like and clean it up the way that I want. Uh, so it doesn't matter. The V bit will come and take over and clean up where the end mill couldn't get to. But I'd like the V bit to do as less work as possible and, uh, you know, choose the right size end mill for the job. In this case, it's going to be an eighth inch end mill. Okay, so 60 degree V bit, eighth inch end mill, zero start depth, eighth inch flat depth. We're going to do an offset cut. And I'm going to come down here and I'm going to name this top, just top, top text, whatever, you know, whatever you want it to be. But right here, this is key vector selection. 90% of the times we are generally selecting a vector and then calculating the toolpath, right? You know, we select, we manually, manually select the vector for what we want. Well, in this case, we're going to automatically select the vectors based on the layers. So I want this filter here to select all open and closed vectors and associate them with the toolpath that I'm creating, and I want all of the layers on the top text layer, okay, or my class top layer, all of those. So if I close this, you'll notice that my three borders and my top text were the only things that were selected. They are now automatically associated with this toolpath. OK, if I wasn't doing text on text and I had the, my design, you know, separated by layers and I associated those layers with a toolpath, if I made any change to that design whatsoever, I could simply just recalculate that toolpath and it'll automatically pick those new changes and recalculate those new changes for me and everything. So we're going to let it auto on the vector selection. We're going to let it automatically select it. All open and closed vectors associated with the toolpath on the top text layer. That's the one we're calculating from zero to an eighth of an inch. So we're going to go ahead and calculate that. Okay. Now I'm going to turn my preview quality down some. Uh, so it's a little bit faster in the preview. So we're not sitting here waiting on it and all, and all that stuff. So if I were to preview my visible toolpaths, I have a clearing toolpath, which is my eighth inch end mill. And I've got a V carve toolpath, you know, just to, you know, without the word clear, that's my V bit. So if I were to preview those, <clears throat> okay. So far, that's what my design looks like. Okay. Cut between those lines, skipped between those, cut between those, skip between those, just like we talked about earlier. All right. So that's my top text layout and everything. All right. Now, 
now, if I, let's go back to the 2D view here. <clears throat> On my object here, this, this medallion that they are, you know, what have you, I want this carving in the bottom. Okay. But I do not want uh, it to run the same as my bottom text uh, toolpath that I'm about to calculate. So this inside object and this object, I need to really put them on another layer by themselves, not my border, not my border. That's my boundary to keep the wood from getting carved away. But I really need to put them on a uh, another boundary. I'm not going to, I want to show you what this what would happen if I, if I associate, if I create a V carve toolpath, Starting at zero, you always start at zero uh, for a V-carved toolpath. Zero, and in this case, it's going to a quarter of an inch. Eighth inch plus, plus an eighth inch is a quarter. Why are we starting at zero if we've already carved that first eighth of an inch away? Because our V angle transition, our V angle transition is transitioning from the top of our board down to the bottom of that cut. So from zero to a quarter of an inch. If I was doing a straight pocket cut, then I could create one tool path for my top text from zero to an eighth of an inch. And then I could create my second tool path from an eighth of an inch to a, you know, an eighth of an inch for a total of a quarter, you know, eighth plus eighth. I could do that. You know, I could start that eighth of an inch down, but this is a V cut and we're transitioning from the top of our board down, nice little angle and everything down. So we always start at zero, even for the bottom text. Okay. All right, so we're going to start at uh, zero and cut down to a quarter of an inch. Same 60 degree V bit, eighth inch end mill offset. We're going to call this bottom. And we're going to use our vector selector here. Associate the open and close vectors with all of the vectors that are on the bottom layer, bottom text layer. Okay, and we'll calculate that. Now, by leaving that established 2020 and that inner boundary in there, what I've done is my toolpath is being calculated from zero down to a quarter of an inch, but I didn't have any vectors. You know, this established 2020 wasn't at, you know, zero. It wasn't on my top text layer. It's only on my bottom text layer. So when I preview this toolpath, you're going to notice the established 2020 is blunt, flat, and quite ugly. Okay. Let's zoom in and let's focus on that. It's blunt, flat. There's no definition and everything at all in here because the other eighth of an inch that should have been on there isn't there, right? And remember, it cones down. It, it's got that offset, that transition from the top of the text. Let's turn this sideways. From the top of the text all the way down to that quarter of an inch. Well, that top text or that top piece of wood was milled away. So it's like cutting off the top half of this established 2020. That's not what I want, you know? So by leaving it in that bottom text layer and not separating it out, I've done that to myself, all right? So we're going to remedy that right now. We're going to come in here and we're going to take the just the inside because this is protecting. This is going to let the bit go around this oval area and keep that area from all that wood from getting carved away, you know, and everything on that bottom text layer. Uh, but we're going to... Um, these two objects here inside in the established 2020, I want to move them, not copy, move them this time to a new layer. And I'm just going to put this as my um, established date, you know, and uh, I can go ahead and um, click OK. And now I'm going to go back in and recalculate my bottom text toolpath. And notice it's not selected because I'm still using that automatic selection. So notice it, it's not selected now. And I'm going to calculate that toolpath. Okay. 
All right, we're going to reset this preview, and currently we're going to preview all the tool paths. And now's the time to start asking questions, guys and girls, because we're literally about to the end of this. Um, we just got two more tool paths to create and talk about. Uh, but now's the time to ask questions, uh, you know, if you have any. But here's my top text pocket cut. Now the V-carve cut. Now the bottom text pocket is getting milled out. It's carving in the order that's in my list down below. But we're going to swap up that order in a minute. And there's my bottom text. And there's my little island right there. That outside border, you know, my little island uh, that uh, didn't get carved away. That bit went around it and everything. So now I have a place to carve my established 2020. And I want it raised too and everything. Uh, you know, I just, you know, didn't want it all the way up at the top level here. I wanted some, you know, difference or dimension and everything in there. So now I'm going to create my tool path for these two objects. I'm going to create my tool path for those two objects. And that's going to be a V-carve cut as well. But this time, because this is only carving at that lower level, I need to start it at an eighth of an inch and end it at an eighth of an inch. One eighth plus one eighth is a total of a quarter inch deep. You do not say start at an eighth and end at a quarter because then that's three eighths of an inch deep. Okay. You're starting at an eighth of an inch down and ending it from that point an eighth of an inch below that. And now that's going to take my vectors here from top and carve them down an eighth of an inch like I want. Nothing's changing with my tools and everything. Go ahead and this is going to be called my established date and calculate that. And now I can preview that visible toolpath. And there we go. Okay. So now... You know, we've got that nice little raised area and everything. Okay. All right. So for the most part, that's our text on text design there. Let's give this a uh, little bit of color uh, and everything. Let's give these tool paths a little bit of color and all. Um, so we can kind of not, I don't need my tool database um, preview. So we can kind of establish what's what. Uh, I'm going to use the tool path coloring here. And I'm going to drag my double click on my toolpath list and put it up here. So because uh, with my screen so big, I can't see everything. By the way, if you do double click on your uh, toolpath top here or toolpath, uh, if you double click on that, it brings out this pop up here uh, for you. Uh, so on this one, I want the um, these two. Yeah. I want this one. Uh, we'll go ahead and make it red. It's Valentine's Day or maroon. And this one for the established, we'll make that maroon. Uh, the bottom, we'll make that one maroon. The bottom clearing, make that maroon. The top clear, I don't want uh, the top. Uh, let me see here. Yep, the top, I want that one maroon. And I do not want the top clear color, just those four colored there. Uh, that'll give me some color in here so I can kind of see what that's looking like. You know, like if I painted it and everything. So we've got that nice little uh, raised text look and all. But we're not done. we got two more tool paths to create. And this is uh, for our profile. Now on this profile, on this heart, let's turn off my um, layers here for a minute and turn on my outside profile. Outside profile. For this top cut here, this top profile, it, it, on the edges of the heart, I'd like them to be rounded over a little bit. And uh, in, in this case, I'm gonna use a round over tool. And in my tool database, um, I have in my tool arsenal of tools in my shop and everything, I have the um, white side 2050 eighth inch roundover bit. And um, 
and that's what I'll be using. It's a nice little eighth inch round over bit. Uh, I, I, I don't know how much it costs. I think it's like 20 bucks or something like that. It's not really expensive. Uh, it's a nice little eighth inch round over just to kind of break the corners and give me a nice light round over. And it's the model number. White side is the brand. 2050 is the tool number. And that's, that's what I use. And so for the first profile, same profile line, I'm going to use the same profile line for the round over and the final cut. Uh, but I'm going to do a profile tool path and I'm going to cut a quarter of an inch deep with my white side round over. I'm going to cut on the outside of the line, but I want it to overlap the line by a negative 0.125 inches. Okay. Now, Laney, why is that? Why is that, you know, rounding over 0.125 inches? Well, let me calculate this tool path. And I'm just going to call this my round over. And let's go back into the drawing tab for a moment before we preview that. And let me explain to you. All right. Let me draw out this uh, round over bit real quick. I'm going to start out and you need to learn how to draw out your profiles of your bits and all for form bits. Form bits are things like round over bits, OG bits, uh, um, you know, uh, rope bits and things with a decorative profile, edge cutting bits. You got to draw out the right side of the profile um, in, in order to add it to uh, the tool database and you got to draw it to scale. So in the case of this um, round over bit, uh, the width, the total cutting width of this round over bit is three eighths of an inch. Uh, the total height of the round over bit, uh, is a, a quarter of an inch and it has a round over radius of an eighth of an inch. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that here. I'm going to go into node editing on this and I'm going to go ahead and right here in the center, I'm going to cut that vector right there in the center and I'm going to cut that vector right over here or on the side and I'm going to delete this top corner. So there's part of my round over. Now that round over bit has a 16th of an inch straight edge, you know, uh, here. So let's go to 0.0. I'm going to zoom in so I get my 0.0625 space bar to finish. And the nose here, if I go into node editing mode, I'm going to cut the vector here. And I'm going to move that line, move it downward another eighth of an inch because it's actually an eighth of an inch lower. So I'm going to move it relative negative 0.125. And then I'm going to take this vector and this vector, and I'm going to join them together with a straight line. And then I'm going to select this vector here, and I'm going to go into my join tool and make those one open vector. So one continuous vector. Now, if we were to measure this, <clears throat> my horizontal offset measurement from this point. So let's, before we measure that, let's imagine that I'm rounding over a corner. So I'm going to draw a rectangle. You know, I'm rounding over that corner. So I need that bit to come down to where that, you know, right at the top of that radius and I need it to come over to the inside of that bit so it rounds over that corner. And so if we were to measure that offset, my cut depth vertically from here, from here, let's move down, to here needs to be a quarter of an inch. That's my cut depth. My offset allowance to allow it to go over the line from the inside of this bit. So from here to here, it's an eighth of an inch. That's that negative 0.125. I 
that allows the that allows the bit to step over that eighth of an inch over the line so that it'll give me a nice round over along that profile. Okay. So that's why the cut depth was a quarter of an inch. And that's why it was a, the allowance was negative 0.125 because of the bit. All right. So if we go in and we preview this cut, That's going to give me that nice rounded over edge, you know, that nice rounded over edge and everything. And by the way, um, let me just say this. Once you have your right side of your profile, let me close this tool. Once you have the right side of your profile drawn, select the profile before you open your tool database. If you're adding it to the tool database, Make sure your profile is selected and choose the category that you're going to put it under. And I'll, in this case, I'll put it up here because I already have it down there. But with that selected, I'm going to click add. And for the tool, I'm going to choose form tool. And it's going to automatically put in the tool with the diameter, the three eighths. It's going to draw out the other half of the tool and everything. Uh, in this case, it's a two flute and it's saying, hey, you already have a tool just like it in there. Do you want to copy the settings from this? I could say yes, copy. Uh, and it'll fill in my settings. But if I was starting from scratch and I had no settings, my cut depth, my pass depth on this generally is going to be a quarter of an inch. I'm not going to take, I could take passes with it, you know, an eighth of an inch per pass. But generally, I just take the full quarter of an inch round over. Um and my step over is going to be a third of the bit, eighth of an inch, eighth of an inch, eighth of an inch. So 33.3% for a total of an eighth of an inch step over. I'm going to run this at 24,000 RPMs at a feed rate of 60 and a plunge rate of 15. Okay, they're going to be a chip load of about one thousandths of an inch, 13 ten thousandths of an inch um, and everything. But uh, when you're drawing your tool, your profile bit, only a form tool, only something with a special profile. When you're drawing that tool, make sure you draw it to scale. You need to draw it to scale. Okay. All right. I'm going to discard those changes. I don't need another round over bit in there, but that's that. All right. So we got a nice little round over here. Now I'm going to take that same selected vector and do another profile cut. This time, it's going to cut all the way through the material. All the way through the material. Uh, it's going to be with my, I'll just use a quarter inch end mill. And I'm going to change my passes. Uh, I've got them taking a sixteenth of an inch per pass. I'm not very aggressive with my cutting. I like letting the, you know, not overworking the bits too much. But I'm going to knock it down to uh, seven passes. And... Um, I'm going to be on the outside of the line. No step over, no offset. This is my end mill. This is my final profile cut. And uh, at this point, we would add some tabs in, you know, add some tabs. Uh, let's say I want my tabs to be quarter of an inch uh, wide, uh, eighth of an inch thick is fine. And I'll throw a tab in, you know, here, here, and here and here. Now, the uh, when this part gets cut out, my router bit's going to cut and remove that material over here and over here. So I'm going to have two halves, basically this top half and this bottom half. I want to make sure that I put enough tabs because if I have a clamp on this corner and a clamp on this corner, you know, or if I'm using double sided tape, whatever the case may be, I want to make sure I've got enough uh, you know, tabs that are going to hold my pieces together and all that. So that my part doesn't, you know, go flying on. And these will be fine because this will hold this top section. This will hold the bottom section and everything. All right. So with that, we'll go ahead and this is going to be my final cutout. And 
I should be putting the bit information in here and all these tool paths so I don't have to keep guessing. Uh, but calculate that. And that's going to be my, you know, preview that. And it's going to cut right at that transition, right at that roundover transition. It's going to cut that part out. And in this case, I'm going to uh, turn off tabs for a moment just for preview purposes only. So as you can see here, I've got, you know, one, two, three. This piece will just move out of the way unless you want to add two tabs up there in that piece. Uh, so, you know, that's the final part and and everything. You know, nice little round over edges and, and all that. Now, remember in the very beginning of the job, I set this up as a two-sided job because I said I wanted to put a keyhole on the back. You know, I wanted to put a, maybe a keyhole to uh, hang this up on the wall and stuff. And um, I need to do that, you know. Uh, um, I need to add some alignment pin holes uh, for this. And I need to um, uh, put my keyhole uh, toolpath on the back. Because uh, so, that's going to be the first thing I'm going to cut. I'm going to cut the keyhole toolpath. Then I'm going to flip it over and then do all the, you know, the rest of the top work and everything. Now, I could be all lovey-dovey and on the backside, not only put a keyhole, but I could put a little secret message that nobody's going to see because it's hanging up on the wall. It's only going to be between me and the missus. I love you so much, dear, and all that mushy stuff, you know, and we could do that on the backside, you know, along with the keyhole and everything, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, it's it's when it's hanging on the wall, you know that that message is back there. No one else does because it's hanging on the wall. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, let's, before we flip this over, or before we create our uh, alignment pins and all that stuff, let's flip this over and let's ask a question here. Um, Raymond uh, asked a question, just curious, can you show the time for each cut? Absolutely, Raymond. I will do that. Um, and uh, uh, it will uh, be in just a moment. That's usually, I'll do that. That's kind of the last thing I do to give you a little bit of a rundown on how much everything how, how long this project would take to cut. So great question. All right, let's, let's get our alignment pin holes uh, set up and everything. I'm going to, I'm going to use a quarter inch uh, dowel pins. I use metal dowel pins, little shelf pins, uh, but you can use quarter inch dowel, but I'm going to throw one up here, quarter inch hole up here and just one uh, down here somewhere. They don't have to be a, they don't have to be, you know, in any particular order because of the method that I use and that I'm about to teach you. Um, if I were cutting all the way through this board into my waste board to set my alignment pins, then I need to be straight across from one another, you know, whether it's side to side or top and bottom, you know, uh, this method here, I can put my alignment holes really anywhere that I want to. Uh, and, um, because we're only cutting halfway through the top side of the border in this case, it'd be the back side because we're doing the keyhole first. Uh, and then halfway through or not halfway through, but uh, we're cutting down into our waste board. And you'll see that in just a minute. But I'm going to take both of these objects here and my final profile here, and I'm going to copy those to the other side. Copy to other side. Okay. So up here, I have a little uh, uh, icon for toggling back and forth from side one to side two. So I'm going to switch over to side two. And you'll see here that my heart's upside down because I'm flipping along the Y axis on my CNC machine. And, um, you know, uh, the yellow ruler just gives us, a, you know, a visual that, hey, we're in the bottom of the cut. Also, this little arrow is at the bottom, pointing at the bottom of the board. And if we looked at the toolpath, it says bottom over here for the toolpaths and stuff. Okay. So in this, all I need to do is I'm going to create two toolpaths. Um, or I could, like I said, if I wanted to, I could be all sweet about it. And, you know, um, uh, let's see here. Oh, all right. Let's get that. We'll put that somewhere right about here. We're going to hit nine on the keyboard, rotate that around because that's going to be the bottom side. We want it to be right side up. 
uh, side to side. I do not like that font. Uh, let's change that to a monotype course of a. I like the mm, Blender script has its place. No. Let me see here. Make that bold. All right. Once again, I've got to weld that text together, replacing it, you know, so all of my letters are overlaps and all are away. I love that feature in version 10. Uh, that's uh, so helpful nowadays um, and everything. So I'll create an additional toolpath. There'll be a V-carve toolpath. So I'm going to have a, um, I'm going to have my alignment pinhole toolpath, my keyhole toolpath, and then my little inscription. Oh, all right. All right. Let's start off with the alignment hole toolpath. Um, this is going to be a drilling operation for me. Uh, and it's going to be a cut depth of three eighths of an inch deep with a quarter inch end mill. I'm going to have it peck uh, down uh, as it cuts. And this is going to be my board uh, alignment holes. Okay, these are going to get cut into the board, three eighths of an inch deep in those waste areas and all. Let's reset this preview. So those will get cut in the board. Now, once that's cut and once my little inscription is cut, let's create that V carved tool path. Uh, I'm going to start this at 0.01, uh, no flat depth, no flat area clearance tool. I'm going to... Uh, Message to my love. <laughs> All right. So it says, hey, you've got some things going on with your vectors. Do you want to go to the vector validator, which is a tool from 9.5, to check it? Or do you want to continue anyway? Well, I want to actually check it. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the vector validator tool. And... Let's see if my eyes can pick up on uh, what the issue is. I don't see anything right away. So the vector validator tool, I'm going to go ahead and have it search the selected. And right there, uh, I've got one overlap and 42 intersections. 42 intersections. So all these little loops and dudes, right? All those little loops and everything. So... 42 of those bad boys. Now I have a decision. I can go through and I can go through and uh, ungroup this. And I could go through and trim up each one of those intersections. They're actually not truly intersections. Um, or I could choose uh, to, to work with a different font or what have you. And in this case... Ladies and gents, I want to work with a different font, but you would go through and you'd have to clean up those intersections and everything. And that's what the vector validator tool is really great for. Uh, let's see here. Let's find a. Abriella. Uh, see if Abriella is going to give me. Yeah, it's pretty clean. Uh, bold. Still pretty clean. Uh, let's go two inches tall. All right. Before I weld, and it, I'm working upside down here, but before I weld, I'm going to go into my text spacing tool, hold down my shift key, and push that apart a little bit. Not too far out. Actually, let's lowercase the uh, everything 
she's not that important. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Everything. We'll throw some exclamation points in there. Ooh, those exclamation points are ugly. All right. So we'll uh, close that. All right. So spacing looks good with that. Um, it. Let's size it up. All right. Let's go ahead and weld together what we can. Replacing that. And then we've got some nasty looking... See, I've got all those loops. I don't like that one either. Hold on a second, guys and girls. Oh, sometimes these font creators. Uh, let's see here. Okay, I'll go with that one. Close. All right, let's weld that together. And I want to get rid of these uh, little um, junk in there. And I believe I'm good to go on that font, finally. All right, let's go in here and select that font and calculate that. And that'll be my little inscription. Okay. Oh, she'll love us for that. All right. Now my keyhole toolpath, guys. This is my favorite one because uh, there's two ways to do a keyhole toolpath. And I'm going to show you both ways. Number one, using the gadget within the Vetric software. Uh, the Vetric software has a keyhole toolpath gadget here. And the only thing we need to create that gadget is a circle, a starting point. So in my case, I'm going to go ahead and uh, create a quarter inch circle right about here. And let's, I'm going to draw a one inch line from the center of the circle. One inch. Close enough. I'm going to pretend that's my keyhole for a second. And I want to get it centered up. There we go. And we do not need that line. Get rid of it. You only need the circle. All right. So on this, uh, with this, we could go into the gadget keyhole toolpath. And this, uh, if I'm looking at it upside down, I can go left to right or right to left, either one. I want to go um, horizontal right to left, that way, right to left. And um, my slot depth is going to be a quarter of an inch based on my keyhole bit. The length of the cut, I want it to be a one inch keyhole slot. My entry hole is going to be three eighths of an inch deep or three eighths of an inch. That's the size of the head. And my slot diameter is 3 16 That's the size of the neck of the keyhole bit. Now, you can't add it. You cannot add a keyhole bit to your toolpath by drawing out the profile like we did the roundover. You have to use what is referred to as a dummy end mill. Basically, a regular end mill set up as a dummy end mill. And it basically, this toolpath just reads the feed rate and speed, the feed and speed off of that. It only is controls the feeds and speeds, okay? So don't try to add a keyhole toolpath or a dovetail toolpath to your tool database. Set yourself up some dummy bits. In this case, I have a keyhole dummy and I have a dovetail bit dummy. Uh, and the dovetail bit is based on the size of my dovetail. The keyhole bit is based on my keyhole. Okay. And again, it doesn't care. It doesn't care about any of this. It only cares about the feed and plunge. All right. So I'm going to select my dummy keyhole bit. And I'm going to click OK. And it's going to create my keyhole, keyhole slot. All right. Um, and all that wonderful jazz. Now, 
if you have Vetric VCarve desktop design software, you do not have access. You do not have access to the gadget library. So you have to do a workaround. Okay. And um, I'm going to show you that workaround. But before I show you that workaround, Tippy Looter asks the question, can you start the vector validator manually? Absolutely, Tippy. The vector validator is under the edit objects menu. It is the last icon on the second row, this little check mark here. Basically, you will select the vectors, you know, whatever it is you're wanting to check, open up your vector validator tool here, and, you know, you can search your selected vectors. Okay. All right. But yes, it's here. Vector validator tool is right there. Great question. Thanks. All right. So for creating your own keyhole toolpath, we don't need a circle, uh, and you don't have access to the gadget, we're going to use a rectangle. And we're going to draw a rectangle. And the rectangle for me is going to be one inch. That's how wide I want my keyhole, one inch. But the height is only going to be 0 0.001 inches tall. Okay, 0 0.001, one thousandths of an inch. And I'm going to go ahead and right here at the center, I'm going to create that uh, wherever I want it to be. You know, move it where you want your keyhole to be. That's good enough for me. And if we zoom in really, 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 really close, you'll see there's a very little rectangle there. We're going to take and zoom in to one side of the rectangle, wherever you want that hole to start. And in my case, I'm going to go right to left. So I'm going to zoom into the right side here and I'm going to go into node editing mode and I'm going to remove that span, that line. That gives me a start point and an end point. What that means is, is my router bit is going to plunge in at the start point here. It's going to come down, cut, go over and come back at a thousandth of an inch away. And it's going to come back up. That thousandth of an inch is barely, barely ever noticeable. You know, uh, you can't even see it with human eyes. So basically it's like the keel bit coming out of the same hole that it went into just a thousandth of an inch over more than that. So that's going to how you create your, and that is a profile toolpath. So you would create that profile toolpath and your cut depth and you know, it's a quarter of an inch, just like your, cause you're, you're still using your keyhole bit guys, but um, you're still using your keyhole bit, but you are um, calculating it as a regular toolpath profile toolpath. And uh, this would be the keyhole slot. And calculate okay and so if we zoom in that bit's going to come down cut over and up now my uh Make sure you're on the line. <laughs> I was like, what in the hell? Uh, on the line. On the line. Not outside the line. On the line. Calculate that. Reset that preview and preview the visible toolpath. Okay? To create that slot. On the line. Don't be on the outside of the line and do what I just did. Or else you're going to have a very whole big keyhole slot. Uh, so that is how you manually create a keyhole slot. Uh, you know, for hanging pictures or what have you, if you do not have access to the gadget library, keyhole toolpath, okay? Okie dokie. Rectangle, 0 0.001 inches wide by however long you want it to be. Cut off one of the end spans, you remove one of the ends and create a profile toolpath. Generally, uh, about a quarter of an inch deep. Uh, it'd be about, you know, your max. Depending on, it, it all depends, I can't say that. It all depends on your keyhole bit. You know, it's got to get past the head to the neck, right? Okay. All right. So I've got a keyhole tool path. I only need one. So I'll delete this one. So I got a, my alignment holes. I've got my message and I've got my keyhole tool path. Okay. So that's exactly what I would run for this. And, uh,
my two holes and everything. All right. Then once it was done carving, I would take this board and unclamp it from my table, move it out of the way. And I'm going to now flip back over to side one and I need to create my waste board alignment holes from the copies that are on the other side. My waste board alignment holes. That's going to be my drilling operation. It's going to be in my waste board. I only cut a quarter of an inch deep. That allows me to use my half inch by quarter inch diameter pins. I'm cutting three eighths of an inch into my board, a quarter of an inch into there. Uh, that leaves me about a little, you know, a little eighth of play or so. Um, I'm going to be using a quarter inch end mill. I'm going to use pecking. And this, uh, the name is super important for me on here because it reminds me that it's my waste board alignment bowl. Now, because I'm moving my project board out of the way and, and then I'm going to touch off my, put my end mill in, touch off and, uh, you know, cut my waste board alignment holes, the um, for me, because I'm starting for me, because I'm starting and working off the bottom of my material, my waste board is zero, right? My waste board is zero. Um, my project thinks that those holes are getting cut in the top of my board, my three quarter inch board. So my waste board alignment holes for me, because I'm working off the bottom of the material is my Z zero, my waste board. I need to um, have a start depth of 0.75 because it's, it's going to start at it's going to ah, it's going to raise up and come down 0.75 inches and then cut in a quarter of an inch into my waste board. Now, if you are working from the material surface as your Z0, you're going to touch off on your top of your board for, you know, when you're carving your project. When that project gets moved out of the way, you're going to zero out on your waste board and then cut. And your cut depth, your start depth will be zero for you. So just remember your material surface, if your zero, Z0 material surface, um, if your project is set up for material surface as the Z zero position, your start depth is zero and you touch off on your materials that you're cutting into. In this case, project board when you're carving in the project, waste board when you're carving in the waste board. Okay. If you are working from the material bed, machine bed, uh, the bottom of the material, you know, my waste board is Z zero position then you're going to be touching off for your zero on the waste board throughout the whole project. And you just need to create a start depth, the thickness of your material, because it's got to go down that far to start carving into the waste board. Okay. Cause it's assuming that I'm cutting in the top of my three quarter inch board, you know, a quarter inch down, but no, I'm actually carving the waste board. That board's not even on the table right now. So I have to start down three quarters of an inch to bring it to zero and then a quarter of an inch below that. Okay. 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 So for me, for me, because of my job setup, three quarters of an inch and I'm cutting a quarter of an inch down into the waste board. Okay. No suitable vector selected. Of course not. Calculate. All right. Okay. <clears throat> now, let me recalculate. Let me show you that message that just popped up. It's another little reminder here. Uh, that warning message. Hey, your material thickness is three quarters of an inch. This is cutting through the material by one inch. Well, that's exactly, do the math. Three quarter. One, one inch minus three quarters is a quarter of an inch. So it's going to be cutting into my waste board a quarter of an inch. Okay. All right. Now, if you see this, 
um, message in in any other scenario besides you know what we're doing here with the key with the uh, the, the alignment pins. Make sure you heed the warning, you know, make sure everything is correct that you meant to cut through and all. In this case, I intentionally am cutting through that three quarter inch board that's not in the way right now. It's been unclamped from the table and I'm cutting a quarter of an inch into my waste board. Okay. All right. So that. disappeared on me waste board alignment holes i don't know where it went to but we're going to do it again uh starting at 0.75 on this little hole here and this little hole here quarter of an inch end mill pecking calculate click ok there's my tool path and that's going to get moved to the very top of the list that's the very first tool path that i run when i flip that board over after i run that tool path and everything i'm going to stick my little dowel pins in my waste board and i'm going to take my project board flip it over and i'm going to line up those holes and drop it into position and then i'm going to run my tool pass now what order do we run the tool pass in well Remember, I've got my top and, and my bottom here because it's a text on text, but I have, you know, I'm using an end mill here and here, and I'm using an end mill here, right? So I can do all of those at one time. So I'm going to put all of those together, you know, because they all use the same bit, eighth inch end mill, eighth inch end mill, eighth inch end mill, okay? Okay. My V carve cuts, my 60 degree V bit, 60 degree V bit, 60 degree V bit. Those are together. Okay. I'll be saving these as one tool path and the V bits as one tool path. Then my round over bit and my final cutout. Now, it is absolutely crucial that you make sure that when you save these tool paths and everything, that the word top, that your top tool path is on top of bottom. If you have that bottom on top of top, it's going to carve from the deepest depth to the shallowest depth backwards, right? It's going to plunge deep and then cut shallower as it goes. We don't want that. We don't want to bury that bit. So you make sure that your top toolpath is above the bottom. Okay. And that bottom has to be cleared away before the established date little pocket can get done. So that's, that's last in the list. Okay. So when we save this tool pass here, I'll double click on this to pull the list out here so you can see. Uh, my first tool path, it's going to be a uh, quarter inch end mill. Um, it's going to be a quarter inch end mill. And uh, so it'll be by itself. So we'll save that. And we'll create a new folder here. Valentine 2020. And we're going to have the, I'm just going to call this side two wasteboard. Wasteboard holes. Uncheck that. And my top text clearing, my bottom text clearing, and my established date clearing all use the same end mill. Those are going to get saved together. This will be my side to O2. This will be my second cut. Side to clearing for Valentine's project, whatever you want to call it. And it's a point one, two, five in mill. 
All right, uncheck those. Top text V carved, bottom text V carved, the established state V carved. Those V bits are going to get saved. That's going to be my third cut for side two. And side two is the top because we're the side one is the back side where we're doing the keyhole and all that stuff first. Uh, and this is going to be the uh, V carved portion for the Valentine's project. And it's a 60 degree V bit, V bit. All right. And then got a round over tool path. That's going to be my fourth cut, 04. Side two, round over. White side, 2050. That's all I need for that. And then finally, my final profile cut. And that's going to be 05, the fifth cut for this of side two. Final cutout, quarter inch end mill. Say, all right. So that takes care of the top side, which, you know, is going to be side two in our case. Uh, I need to flip over to the other side and get my tool pass for there. We're going to save this. And let's pop this up so you can see it again. So uh, for this, uh, we're going to go 01. That's my first cut. And this is the board alignment holes. Board means it's cutting into my board. And... Uh, 0.25 in mill. Side one. Throw that side one in there. Might as well keep it consistent. Uncheck that. My V bit. O2. Side one. Second cut. Side one. It's the V carve. And uh, 60 DGV bit. Uncheck that. Check the keyhole slot. Save that toolpath. And this is going to be my third cut for side one. Keyhole. slot and that's my 0.375 keyhole bit all right so when we look at this we should have our side one boards our first second and you know um first second tool path our board alignment holes our v-carve cut number three is our keyhole slot that should take care of the three cuts for side one. The board gets moved out of the way. Then we run our side two waste board holes. Um, and if we want to uh, rename this, we'll make this 01. All right. So for side two, we're going to uh, carve our waste board holes. Then we're going to go from there and carve our uh, clearing toolpath, all of our clearing, followed by the final V cut, then the round over, and then the final cutout. So if we were to preview that, it would look a little bit like this. So for the back side, if we preview all the toolpaths, our alignment holes, our text, and our keyhole slot. That board get moved out of the way. Be would touch off if you had to on your waste board. If you're not working off the bottom, touch off on your waste board, run that toolpath, or you just uh, you know start it 
point touch off on your waveboard and start at 0.75 if you're working from the bottom of the material. And um, for side one, we are running our clearing. Oops. So all the pocket work all the way down. Okay, so all the pocket work and everything, let's go ahead and turn off the material color for a moment. All the flat work, when that was done, we'd come back and we would run our V-carve tool pass, tool path, tool path number three to do all the V-cut work. Follow that up with the round over cut and then the final profile cut. Don't forget to add tabs to your profile cut. Mine does not have tabs for preview purposes only. Uh, so I can remove this to show you the cut. Now, this is where you would be creative in, uh, you know, painting your design up if you wanted to or uh, what have you. Give it a nice, you know, or you could just stain it, whatever. You know, it all depends on the wood that you choose and how you want it to look. It'd look good either way. It doesn't necessarily need to be painted. Um, it could be uh, stained. And, you know, if it was a, a nice uh, dark wood or something, you know, or what have you, you know, it could look good. However you decide that be, that's up to you. Uh, in my case, I'd most likely, uh, you know, paint it. I, it's a, you know, tricky to paint. I can use the aura mask for most of it, you know, my stencil film and everything for like around the edge and, you know, the stencil film, but when it gets down to that bottom layer, you know, there's that stencil film gets milled away. So, uh, you know, it's a little tricky when you're doing text on text, painting it and stuff. Um, and getting down into in between those letters and everything. And so it's a little bit tricky, but you can always paint, uh, you know, seal paint and sand. That's one way, but that only gets you to the top layer. Then you have all this bottom stuff that's an actually, you know, an eighth inch lower than everything else. Uh, sanding, it's a lot of hand sanding, you know, with excess paint. So finishing is just, uh, it is what it is. You got to, you know, kind of figure out how you want to finish it. But this is a 19, uh, about 18 inch tall. How tall is this sucker? Uh, not bad. It's uh, yeah, 18 inches tall uh, by about 19 inch wide. Um, heart. And, uh, Nice little project. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, Time-wise, uh, let's go back to Raymond's question about cut times and uh, and everything. So let that uh, let that run out real quick, and then we'll. Okay, so for side two, let's go into our clock here. Now, your estimated time is going to be based on your machine's rapid rates and your machine scale factor. Basically, a scale factor is this. Um, let's say that the project here says it's going to take me 13 minutes to run. And I go out and carve, and on my machine, it takes 26 minutes. So that's a scale factor of two. If it takes 13 minutes to run, that's a scale factor of one. So you want to make sure, you know, if, 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 if 
this says 13 minutes here, but it takes me uh, 15 minutes, 15 and a half minutes, whatever. It's a scale factor about 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. .1 you know, you get in there, but let's do whole numbers. If it's 13 minutes on the dot and it's carves in 13 minutes, that's a scale factor of one. If your machine takes 26 minutes, that's a scale factor of two. If it, you know, takes uh, 39 minutes, that's a scale factor of three. You know what I mean? That's the scale factor. So your rapid rate is how fast your machine moves when it's not cutting and it's highest rapid speed. Uh, and then your scale factor is what, you know, based on your machine. Our scale factor with Digital Wood Carver is 1.3. So uh, the back side of this cut, uh, the alignment holes, the message, and the keel slot is going to take 13 minutes. The alignment holes, about 32 seconds to cut. The message, the V-carb message, about 12 minutes to cut. And the keyhole slot, about 8 seconds to cut. Okay? Total of 13 minutes and 2 seconds. For side 1, uh, this entire... Uh, cut here is going to be about seven and a half hours. That's based on I'm using, you got to remember, I'm using an eighth inch end mill uh, instead of a quarter inch end mill and things like that. Um, and there's a lot of material to be milled away on that top layer uh, with for that eighth inch bit. Um, and you could set it for a quarter inch bit to reduce the time or whatever, but I wanted to get really up in between those letters and everything. Uh, and all. So for me, the wasteboard alignment holes are going to be 29 seconds. The top text clearing, that's the big one. That's the, you know, two hours and 47 minutes for it to clear out that top area. The uh, bottom text area and everything uh, with that end mill, that eighth inch end mill, two hours and 48 minutes, and then three minutes to clear out the uh, little estimated area. The V carve, 33 minutes, 53 minutes for the bottom text and four minutes for the established date. The round over about a minute and 48 seconds. The final cutout about nine minutes and 54 seconds. Uh, the wasteboard alignment holes, 32 seconds. That was done at the first. And um, that's it. Now, this is actually the entire total of side one and side two on here. Seven hours, 35 minutes. Now let's take a look and see what we could do to uh, reduce that a little bit. Let's go into that top text clearing and let's change that end mill to a quarter inch end mill. And the, oops. Let's calculate that make sure you get that top above bottom all right that top text clearing on the bottom text clearing let's uh, see what would happen if we go ahead and take that to a quarter inch as well, or three sixteenths, uh, either one. We'll go quarter, we'll stay consistent. Calculate that out. Oh, my vector selector. My bottom text layer is turned off. That's why it said no vector selected. Got to make sure those layers are turned on. Uh, turn that back on there. And let's do that again. Vector selection, bottom text layer, associate with toolpath, calculate. Oh, what else could we uh, speed up here? Um, That's about it. Let's look at the time and see what that did for us. Uh, let's go into our time and let's open up this here. Let's 
So by changing from an eighth inch end mill to a quarter inch end mill, took it from seven hours and seven hour and some change to four and a half hours. You know, so I knocked three hours off just by changing the size of the end mill. Okay. All right. So you can look and see what you, if you, if you want to optimize or change something out, I don't necessarily want to change anything out. Um, I'd probably use my eighth inch end mill, but uh, I could split the difference and use a three sixteenths inch end mill uh, or, you know, uh, what have you, because on my B carve, I'm now, you know, adding time to the V carve, the V carves because the quarter inch end mill can't get quite into places. Uh, now my 30 minute carving on the, you know, the bottom text has turned into an hour and a half or an hour and four minutes. Sorry. So I've added, I've taken time from one, just added it to the other, you know? So, um, I just got to decide, you know, you just decide on what, you know, would best suit, uh, your needs and all that stuff. But that's the times for, uh, that was for uh, Raymond. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Jerry, good to see you here. I'm glad uh, Spindle TV is up and running again. Uh, Dave Gatton, I don't know if Dave stuck with us all the way through, but uh, Dave Gatton, man, uh, I'm sorry. Earlier I meant to, I saw you pop in and I meant to uh, say uh, hello to you. Uh, Dave's a good friend and guys check out Dave's uh, videos on Saturday nights. I believe they're Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern time. If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, David Gatton, but uh, Gatton CNC or CNC with Dave Gatton. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Hey, Mike. Welcome, Mike Smith. All right. Thanks for another great design. I did find some buffering tonight. All right, Ronnie. Um Ronnie found some buffering. Hopefully uh, there wasn't too much buffering on you guys and girls tonight. Um, hopefully it was smooth. As I'll be it. And, uh, you know, um, go from there. So anyway, let me uh, fix two things real quick. And make sure on your profile toolpath that you do add some tabs, ladies and gents, and everything. But uh, yeah, just a nice little, a nice little sign. There's not, you know, it's basic. It's just I wanted to, sh I really wanted to talk about text on text, and I really wanted to talk about, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we cover tonight as far as offsets and. Uh, you know, keyhole tool pass and uh, working with layers and everything. I just wanted to, you know, uh, it's not necessarily about the project itself. It's about the lessons behind creating the project because you can apply these lessons to other projects, node editing and things and using your extend tool and all that good stuff. So hopefully, um, hopefully you enjoyed tonight's class. Uh, we're going to go to a question. And um, let's see here. Uh, we got a question from Andy. How well do you think using a laminate with a light wood on top with a darker wood on the bottom would work for a contrast? There you go. Uh, Andy's kind of thinking out of the box here. And it doesn't always have to be paint, guys. Uh, I'm not a big fan of staining and painting and things. You know, uh, I don't like it. But man, uh, if you've ever seen any of the projects where people will laminate uh, a thinner layer of a contrasting material on top of, uh, you know, uh, another piece of wood and everything, and then they carve down, exposing that, you know, that contrasting color, let's say a maple and walnut, you know, a thin layer of maple and walnut uh, and everything. And you've got that maple top with that walnut background or, you know, cherry and... Uh, you know, ebony or whatever the case may be, you know, maple and ebony or whatever. 
uh, yeah, Andy, you can absolutely do that. And it's absolutely, uh, it has a stunning effect. Um, you just, uh, yes. Yeah. You can absolutely do that and it can have a stunning effect. And what you would want to do is your depths, you know, how tall your letters are. You want to make sure that you get through that top surface for that bottom, you know, that bottom part of the design, you know, that's in the contract, that's it, that it's in the contrasting, uh, parts of the material and everything, um, and everything. Uh, so <clears throat> it would look, uh, it would look really good. And in this case, uh, you would be, um, for this, your, let's say it was maple and walnut, your maple would go down to the about, uh, what's the depth here? 0.25 inches. And um, your maple would be 0.25 inches and then your uh, walnut would be a half inch thick and everything. And that would give you the same effect as if, um, let me see if I can, let me fix my uh, tool pass here. Uh, top tick square, not that one. Bottom text clear, no fill, red. Um, I wonder why it's not filling in properly. Hold on a minute, then, guys. Set all. Give me a second, guys. Let me get this. Uh... But yes, uh, Andy, that would look uh, very nice. Um, that would look very nice. Okay, let me turn off no fill on that, no fill on the round over. Um, top text clear. Where are you at? Top text clear, no fill on you. There we go. So you would have just about that kind of effect uh, with that. Um, uh, if you had a quarter inch layer of uh, maple on it or whatever, you know, a contrasting color and everything down to the half inch, that half inch area would be, you know, this area down here. And you would want to make sure that, you know, your cuts get down to that uh, and clear away that maple layer to expose that or whatever, not maple. I keep saying maple, but you know, that con to, to expose that contrasting wood and everything. So it stands out and all, uh, you know, that would be uh, key. Now, of course, getting, you know, the uh, color up, you know, along the edges, along the edges, it would be all solid maple, you know, um, and everything, uh, which would uh, look something like, <clears throat> oops. Which would look something like, uh, where is it at, bottom... Top except for you'd have exposure, uh, you know, your contrasting wood in between the letters, you know, in there, you know, but it would be contrasting, except for what's behind that. So I don't know. It it would uh and ignore all these blank areas, those would be 
Uh, those would be your contrasting wood as well. But um, yeah, give it a try for sure. All right, let's see here. Uh, Troy, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you. Um, you are correct. CNC, what they've got Saturday nights. All right. Thank you, Troy. Troy Pritchard, uh, guys. Uh, if you're, uh, if you never have or anything, check out Dave Gatton. He has a blog, uh, video channels, podcast, if you will. Uh, and it's great information. He has a lot of guys that they just, they're, it's all CNC talk and everything. Uh, check them out, um, for sure. And, um, and Andy says any, any issue with glue clogging bits? Well, you always want to, uh, you, I mean, you know, when you're cutting through plywood or MDF or, or things like that, um, uh, you know, or, or laminated boards, you're going to run into glue and stuff. Uh, it, it, it helps, uh, dull bits, you know, it helps, um, you know, uh, uh, reduce the lifespan of, of bits and everything. One of the things that you want to make sure you do is, uh, invest in, in a, you know, some bit and blade cleaner, you know, $8 bottle or however much it is. Uh, and, um, you know, keep your bits clean. Um, uh, what I do with mine, uh, it, like when I'm running a project or whatever, and I, you know, I'm, if I'm cutting in pine or something or, or uh, you know, um, oak or MDF or anything, um, I have uh, some alcohol, quick alcohol that, you know, uh, between tool pass and stuff, I actually kind of uh, dab on some alcohol. Uh, onto the bit to loosen up any of the gum and pitch. And then I have a, a metal brush that I brush the bit with, spin it, brush it. And, uh, you know, before you make sure it's nice and clean before each tool path. But uh, that's that's overkill. Uh, all you need to do is clean your bits regularly, you know, maintain them, drop them in a, you know, a pan of uh, bit and blade cleaner, wipe them down and you're done. So, but yeah, you, always, you know, glue is always going to uh, uh, shorten the life of bits, you know, no matter what, it's going to, you know, pines and pitch and resin and glues, you know, so just part of, part of is what it is. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is 10 o'clock on the dot. We are going to uh, close her down. Uh, I appreciate you uh, coming out and um, hanging with me tonight and going over uh, this project. Hopefully you have uh, enjoyed it and hopefully, you know, Hey, maybe it'll be something nice you can make for the Valentine, you know, those last minute gifts, you know, they love them. They love when you just put a little thought into it. <laughs> it's the thought that counts, honey, but um, uh, don't take advice from me. I'm single. All right, everybody, you guys and girls have a great day. I don't see any more questions, so we're going to say goodnight here. Until next time, I'll see you soon.